Um, I think being an educator and advocate to the public about cultural aspects of mental health or about uh, social, family, community variables in health and mental health. I think that's really valuable for a person if they have that opportunity. I'm, I've been at the, this uh, program for uh, 24 years, uh, 27 years now, uh, since uh, 1987 uh, when I joined as a faculty. But uh, I had actually worked in the program uh, when I was a resident in my senior year of residency, 1983-84. And uh, I was interested in doing it as an elective during my fourth year. And I got, I'd already been interested in cultural psychiatry <clears throat> because during, in my third year, uh, resident uh, rotation in community psychiatry. I was at the Warm Springs Indian Reservation uh, about two hours from here in, uh, from Portland. And that was really interesting seeing uh, the role of culture in mental health and also the role of community supports, family supports, and uh, the power of that in uh, recovery and people and people with chronic psychiatric disorders at least remaining stable. And uh, <clears throat> so I was interested in, in working with Dr. Kinsey. He, he was the training director during the first part of my uh, residency and uh, was responsible actually for me coming here in the first place as a, as a resident. So that was really valuable. And I've actually, I have a, a one patient who has chronic schizophrenia who I saw as a resident who I still see uh, 30 years later uh, as, a, as a patient. And uh, it's been a really great experience having the continuity uh, with patient care that many of us have been able to experience here. Uh, I have two half-day clinics here a week. One is uh, a clinic for Latin American patients. Uh, and uh, then I, uh, that's on Monday morning. And then Tuesday afternoon, uh, I have a clinic uh, for, uh, on alternate weeks, Vietnamese and Cambodian patients. Uh, the Cambodian patients I've been working with since 87 uh, and then in the Vietnamese clinic it's been about seven years that I've been working with uh, Vietnamese patients and uh, so I work uh, with the same case manager for each of those three cultural groups and so I, I supervise that person's work uh, and Latin American case manager is, a, is actually a, uh, a PhD uh, professional and uh, she has a lot of uh, experience not only as a counselor but in uh, human rights research and uh, then the Cambodian counselor I've been working with since uh, 1999 uh, so we have a close working relationship and the Vietnamese uh, case manager I know really well uh, and I had uh, she's been here for, I believe, almost, well, between 15 and 20 years, but I've been working with her since, uh, for the last seven years. So we have a, each of the case managers and I have a collaborative relationship with the patients and, uh, and they, the case manager, will often see patients in between appointments with me and they'll follow up on things like trying to get records from uh, other medical uh, settings or they will do home visits and they also are the primary clinicians in groups that we have for patients on a weekly basis so they they will report uh, to me about things that have occurred with patients in between my appointments with them well I think that uh, there's a number of challenges and I and I'm not I think the ability to uh, sort of metabolize the uh, counter-transfers and emotional feelings over the years probably improves as with experience. But in other ways, the feelings uh, don't change. You know, looking back early in my career and hearing stories of uh, just unbelievable cruelty but also resilience of our patients uh, and the effect of 
each of those extremes in many ways, you know, both admiration for the patient that they've been able to survive and make a, a very important contribution to their communities or to their families, uh, but also, the, you know, the sadness and the horror thinking about what people went through oftentimes when they were children. Um, that really, I think, affects a lot of us. And uh, we did a project here in the, in the program uh, probably about 20 years ago where we interviewed uh, many of the case managers and uh, the other psychiatrists. You know, how, how did everybody deal with this? And it, it was, a, as you would expect, each person did that in a different way. And, but there were some commonalities that people experienced. You know, uh, there were times where people got down about the, you know, just where stories would pile up, you know, particularly maybe in a, in a specific week. And other times, uh, just the incredible um, uh, rejuvenation of, of uh, why we do this kind of work when we encounter, you know, patients during the week that are unbelievably strong and, and, and resilient, or people that have really responded to treatment, where we feel like we've really contributed to their recovery. Those are renewing. So it's it's. Uh, I think the challenge uh, as uh, a professional person over all these years is to be able to keep a balance. And by that I also mean a balance with uh, our lives outside of psychiatry and outside of medicine, you know, and making sure that we give ourselves a break. We also, uh, as a group, intellectualize a lot because we, you know, we publish, we, we're writing, we're always coming up with new ideas uh, about things that are intriguing to us for us to study and that helps too because we feel like we're you know contributing to the literature so um, you know we I think we deal with it and cope with it in, in a variety of different ways what is a couple of things that lead to stigma one is uh, you know the hesitancy that we as mental health professionals have about talking about our own feelings or about our own reactions to things and there's in this kind of a clinic you can't escape that I mean because it you know it, the things that we deal with are not necessarily routine uh, and so but we know we can talk about these things among our colleagues you know that, and people are going to understand within a couple of seconds what we're talking about and, or if we've heard a particularly difficult story, or we've heard a particularly unbelievably positive story of survival, you know, we can share that uh, with each other. Uh, and I think, I think mutual respect among the uh, other psychiatrists and uh, mutual respect among the case managers are admiration for them because many of them have experienced things that our, our patients have experienced. So I think that those, the stigma or the even embarrassment that, you know, psychiatrists or, or experienced professionals might have of revealing one's own reactions are tempered in this kind of a setting, you know. Uh, the other thing which, uh, a different type of stigma is that, you know, uh, we're often uh, taught in medicine, you know, to uh, compartmentalize a lot of social or political issues that uh, we deal that that medicine deals with and in this kind of a setting it's very difficult to do this because the um, the very experiences or the very mental health things that we're dealing with with our patients are directly related to social political or other very powerful forces beyond any of our control and uh, we have our own personal feelings, uh, political feelings about uh, other governments, about other, you know, our own government, you know, that, that change and vary from time to time, you know, policy towards refugees, policies towards immigration. So uh, all of these things are uh, always in the, in the, either the back of our mind or even in the forefront of our mind when we're working with our patients. We can't escape it. And uh, the, uh, we have to be careful about how we deal with those and um, not have it 
uh, influence in a negative way our ability to deliver good care. You know, and you know, and, and because we are, we also occasionally uh, work with people who were not only victims of uh, uh, government sanctioned violence, but may decades ago when they were very young may have themselves participated in it. So that, you know, when we get that kind of information, that complicates our feelings, you know, towards patients. We have to be able to, to uh, recognize it and, and uh, not have it impair our ability to function as, as doctors. You know. What, what happened, yeah, because some of our kids, some of our patients were child soldiers or they, you know, they, uh, I've had some Cambodian patients over the years who uh, were sort of conscripted into the Khmer Rouge when they were, you know, sometimes pre-teens, believe it or not, or early teens, and, uh, you know, were carrying guns when they were, you know, really young kids. And then, as usually happens in uh, those types of political movements, is certain factions start turning against each other, and, and people who are soldiers off, you know, sometimes with the, the, the that everything's turned so that they become prisoners. So, uh, and that certainly has happened with, a, with several of my patients over here. This might, on the surface, seem benign, but um, it, I think it could adversely affect our ability to be good physicians or psychiatrists. And that is, uh, you know, because of the kinds of things we see here and the kind of things that people cope with and go on to not only survive, but actually uh, be very productive, is comparing that to, you know, having the tendency to compare that to sort of everyday things that we hear in other parts of our job. You know, people um, having a great deal of, of stress in their lives related to what we would normally think would be sort of normal things. And they have, you know, great difficulty coping and they seek care from us. And I think that we have to be very careful in not minimizing those experiences that other people have and not trying to set up sort of artificial comparisons or not, not devaluing uh, other people's suffering that, uh, that may occur outside of this kind of a setting where we hear, you know, just more extremes. Um, so we have to keep, I think that's an important thing for people at any level of practice to keep an eye on, not, not only as an, in training, but also as an experienced clinician. I think one of the things that I, uh, one of the things that I would think about initially is, uh, and uh, I have these discussions with medical students a lot, is to keep in mind many of the universals that one sees in this kind of a setting that uh, go much beyond culture. So. And as a psychiatrist and as a healer, to be cognizant of, of basic universal human responses uh, that uh, that transcend specific cultures, and, and not to get lost in the weeds, you know, all the time of uh, well, and to to go too far towards a culturally relative position, you know, in, uh, because that can actually adversely impair the ability to come to a reasonable differential diagnosis and, and treatment plan. Uh, cultural specifics of culture are obviously very important and uh, particularly in how a person understands their illness, uh, how the family understands it, how they will interpret what our recommendations are and their adherence to our recommendations that may vary from culture to culture, and it's very important for us to, to keep that in mind. Uh, but also not losing track of uh, the universal experiences of loss, displacement, uh, family dynamics, cross-generation, cross-generationally, uh, you know, and keeping a template in our heads about uh, roles in different societies, you know, and how those roles can change through uh, immigration and acculturation, and uh, those templates are important to keep in mind 
uh, but also where any specific uh, person or family is along that that uh, continuum may vary, and to you know you know to have general templates in your head, but also seeing that person as a real individual and uh, as part of a particular family microculture, and you might have to tailor what you're doing, to, you know, very much to that particular person. The role of politics in medical care or mental health care uh, is really important for, I think, people to keep in, keep in mind, uh, and that's different from actually being active in some kind of political movement or how you how you deal with that. I think uh, in order to be really effective in this kind of an intercultural setting, which is so, so where our, the problems of our patients are so highly influenced by events in different parts of the world, I think it's really important to keep abreast of, of uh, what's going on in different parts of the world and how, and to uh, if a person has an interest, particularly to be able to read up a bit on the culture and the history of the uh, countries and cultures that they're that they're working with, that the person is working with, that really helps in the depth of understanding of that person and that person's experience. Uh, I think that uh, it is something that's a little bit different is what. The physician may choose to do in regards to political activism. I think that's a very personal choice, uh, and uh, that can either be renewing and something that's really positive, or it can be diverting, or you know, uh, even adversely affect patient care potentially if you're not a, if, uh, if you're not aware of how things intersect. Uh, I think being an educator and advocate to the public about cultural aspects of mental health or about uh, social, family, community variables in health and mental health. I think that's really valuable for a person if they have that opportunity to be involved in community organizations or boards or whatever that influence public education or public policy, you know, and to be able to use the experience in this kind of a setting to and be able to transfer that to uh, those types of you know volunteer uh, opportunities, and um, because uh, you know our our work you know doesn't occur in a, in a vacuum, you know, and, and actually it doesn't. Uh, you you can barely go a day without uh, news web pages or newspapers not having a health story on the. On the home page, or on the first page, you know, and it's it's just become, you know, health and health policy has become such an important part of, of um, you know our public space, so to speak. That that's a really that, that question about evil is a very complicated question, I, and it's something that I haven't uh, really resolved myself, uh, but how I've attempted to resolve it. Is uh, is recognizing it as obviously a real thing, and uh, not becoming immune to it or cold by through some kind of a, you know moral or ethical withdrawal, uh, but also not becoming so con consumed by it that I can't make good clinical decisions or I can't. Uh, work empathetically with the person who's in front of me right then, you know, and uh, that's a battle that goes back and forth, uh, you know, continuously of being over consumed by the reality of what we see that results from evil and, you know, stepping back too much so that we're losing contact with our patient. Um, I think one of the things that helps is uh, being able to grapple with and to think about one's own uh, philosophical, spiritual uh, points of view, and to be able to draw from other fields outside of medicine to be able to, to 
deal with that, whether it's you know, uh, reading philosophy or history or theology or, or whatever to try to make some sense out of things. Um, and uh, also to, it goes back to trying to maintain balance in our, in our own you know, personal lives or our relationships with other people or uh, our relationships with our family, our colleagues, and seeing overwhelming good that is in the world that, uh, and also seeing our patients who are, who are recovering, who have recovered, who are doing well, who have triumphed in many ways over the, the evil that has been done to them, you know, and uh, all of that together is, uh, I think, a uh, way of dealing with that, that stark reality.